The subject today is the return of Jesus, the greatest event in human history, and that's in front of us. But first, we want to look at light in darkness. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. There's an interesting creature that we want to observe today. It's the Antarctic krill. It not only lives in one of the darkest places on Earth, but also in one of the coldest waters of the planet. The Antarctic krill. Its lifespan is between 5 and 10 years. It's 2 inches in length, and it weighs about 1 gram. It lives in depths of the cold, dark waters of the Antarctica down to 300 feet. An estimate 6 billion tons of these creatures live in the Antarctic. And there's a lot of creatures that feed on these krill, all kinds of fish. You can see the pink cloud there that's made up of Antarctic krill as it comes up to, towards the surface. And the fish feed on these krill. But not just fish, these penguins. They love Antarctic krill. In fact, here the mother is bringing up her food again so that the young can eat these tender morsels, this, these pink krill. Also, albatross birds love to feast on krill, as well as leopard seals. And the largest mouth in the world, the whales feed on krill. The interesting thing about the krill is they were made to transmit light in darkness. Yeah, they transmit a yellow globe for about three seconds when the switch comes on. And so they're made to transmit light in the darkness. Remember the verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 6? God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. The Bible also says in Matthew 5, 14, that ye are the light of the world. God has made us to transmit light. God's light of truth, that is. Is it dark where you live? Are you transmitting light? The Bible says in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, the Antarctic krill can't hide its light. No, it's seen however small it is. Let your light shine. We return back to our topic, the returning king. Years ago, when I was a young schoolboy, I used to enjoy poring over stacks of books, lots of books, which were in the basement of the old farmhouse where we lived. One by one, I had to bring these books to a single light that was hanging in the basement. I would ponder over the books. My great uncle had purchased these books at auction sales through the years. But there was one book that especially caught my attention. It was written in German, so I couldn't read it very well. But when I saw one of the pictures, I knew. Beyond a doubt, it was an artist's rendition of the return of Jesus. It was in black and white. I later realized that I had uh, come across the book entitled Daniel and the Revelation in German by Uriah Smith. It's an excellent book on the prophecies of Daniel and revelation from scripture is in details events prior to the return of Jesus, an excellent book. Well, what was so amazing about the concept of the return of Christ to my young mind was that in the Lutheran church that I attended with my parents, the return of Jesus was not talked about except one sermon. One sermon in all the years by an old preacher. Otherwise, there was silence. This topic is the most gripping and the most one of the most important topics. And it still grips my mind so much so that I can't seem to get enough of understanding about the return of Jesus. And that's why I put this presentation together. How am I supposed to prepare for this grand event? So a question. Will Jesus return? That's a fair enough question. Let's see what the Bible says. This is Acts 1, 10 through 11. This is the time when Jesus was ascending to heaven. And the Bible says, while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, these are the disciples who were gathered there with Jesus, and they watched him go up. 
And it says, As he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Why are you looking up into heaven? Then they said, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So these angels of God confirmed the fact that Jesus is returning. This same Jesus. Yes, Jesus is returning. The King is coming. Are you ready? Paul writes about the topic that Jesus is returning. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Jesus will come, and it's going to be noisy. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, Paul says. So, we have four things that are happening when Jesus comes. He descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God sounds. And then you can't miss this, the dead in Christ arise. There's a resurrection of the dead. We want to take a look at the volcano eruption of Krakateo, Indonesia in August of 1883. It was one of the loudest sounds ever heard on the planet. This volcanic eruption in southwest Indonesia killed 36,000 people. The ash cloud estimated to reach 50 miles in the air. Nine square miles of the island was plunged under water. 165 villages disappeared from the 120-foot high tsunami that resulted afterwards. And the blast from this volcano was so loud it was heard more than 2,500 miles away in Australia. But friends, the second coming of Jesus will be louder than any sound the world has ever heard, even the volcanic eruption in Indonesia. The disciples back in Jesus' day had a question. They asked Jesus in Matthew 24, 3, where it's recorded, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Well, in Revelation 6, 12, it says, I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So one of the great signs that Jesus is coming took place in Lisbon, Portugal, November 1st, 1755, is known as the Great Lisbon Earthquake. It struck on the morning of November 1, All Saints Day. Contemporary reports state that the earthquake lasted between three and a half and six minutes, causing fissures 16 feet wide in the city center. Though commonly known as the earthquake of Lisbon, it extended to the greater part of Europe, Africa, and America. It was felt in Greenland, in the West Indies, in the island of Madeira, in Norway, in Sweden, Great Britain, and Ireland. This is the Geophysical Data Center and estimates of an earthquake that measured 8.5 to 9. That's what the estimate that this Lisbon earthquake measured, a massive, massive quake. You can see from the map that it, it's extended out to many parts of the world. Then the Bible also says there shall be sign in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Luke 21, 25. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. Again recorded in Matthew 24, 29. 25 years after the Lisbon earthquake, the sun was darkened at daytime again fulfilling Bible prophecy. It's called the dark day of May 19, 1780. Revelation 6, 12, and 17 again mentions the dark day. I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. That was the Lisbon earthquake. And it says, And the sun became black as sackcloth of air. That's the event we're talking about right now. And the moon became as blood. And the people thought the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That's coming up next. There's one famous scene that took place during that day in the Governor's Council of Connecticut. Surprised by the unnatural darkness, a number of the politicians at the council 
urged the others to adjourn their meeting early. However, a councilman named Abraham Davenport, who was a militia colonel from Connecticut, was vehemently against it. He went down in history for saying the following words. He said, The day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause for an adjournment. And if it is approaching, I choose to be found doing my duty. I wish, therefore, that candles may be brought. That happened in 1780. The occurrence brought intense alarm and distress to multitudes of minds, as well as dismay to the whole brute creation. Fowls fleeing bewildered to their roosts, birds went to their nests, cattle returned to their stalls, frogs and nighthawks began their notes, the cocks crew at daybreak, farmers were forced to leave their work in the fields and business was generally suspended, candles were lighted in the dwellings, this is in the middle of the day, in Isaiah 13, 9 and 10, it talked about the same event. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Joel talks about the same event. Joel chapter 2, 31. The sun shall be dark, turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Acts chapter 2, verse 20, repeating what it said there in Joel 2, it says there, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. John in the Revelation declared the scenes that herald the great day of God, the stars of heaven fell upon the earth. That's the next thing that's supposed to happen. Even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. That's the third event in Bible prophecy. So you had, so far you've had the great earthquake of Lisbon, you've had the dark day in 1780, and now the stars of heaven fell upon the earth. This prophecy received a striking and impressive fulfillment in the great meteoric shower of November 13, 1833. This is from a Christian author who wrote the book, The Great Controversy, page 334. That was the most extensive and wonderful display of falling stars which has ever been recorded. The whole firmament all over the United States, being then for hours in fiery commotion. No celestial phenomenon has ever occurred in this country since its first settlement. Never did rain fall much thicker than the meteors fell toward the earth, towards the east, the west, the north, the south. It was the same. In a word, the whole heavens seemed in motion. The display, as described in Professor Silliman's journal, was seen all over North America. From two o'clock until broad daylight, the sky being perfectly serene and cloudless, an incessant display of brilliant, luminous stars kept up in the whole heavens. Something interesting happened. Back in those days, Slave trade was going on in the South. There was lots of slaves, millions of them. And this is what happened with one of their recordings. But then the white folks started calling all the slaves together, and for no reason. They started telling some of the slaves who their mothers and fathers was, and who they'd been sold to and where. The old folks were so glad to hear where their people went. They made sure we all knew what happened. You see, they thought it was Judgment Day. This is recorded in Irish Times, November 11, 2019. They thought it was Judgment Day. No language indeed can come up to the splendor of that magnificent display. It seemed as if the whole starry heavens had congregated at one point near the zenith and were simultaneously shooting forth with the velocity of lightning to every part of the horizon. And yet they were not exhausted. Thousands swiftly followed in the track of thousands, as if created for the occasion. Again from the book Great Controversy, page 333. Well, Jesus is coming again. He says in Hebrews 9, 28, Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, without sin unto salvation. It confirms this in Hebrews, that Jesus is coming the second time. 
In Matthew 25, 31, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. And in Revelation 22, 7, it says, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And it also tells us in Revelation 22, 12, it repeats it. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. And one more verse from Revelation 22, 20. He which testify these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Question. When will Jesus come? Well, the Bible makes it very plain in Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. We don't know the hour. Matthew 25, 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven. So the angels don't even know. But my Father only, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36. My Father only knows the day I'm coming. Another book called Prophets and Kings page 718, there the Christian author says, the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. Well, since Jesus is coming, how do we prepare for this event? Here's what it says in Matthew 24, 44. So you too must be ready because at an hour you're not expecting him, the Son of Man will come. That's from the ISV translation. In 1 Peter 4, 7, how do we prepare? The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, it says, and watch unto prayer. How many people are sober today? How many people are watching unto prayer? Mark 1, 15, and saying, Jesus has said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's Jesus' own words, to repent of our sins from the things that are doing wrong and believe the gospel, believe the good news that was sent. In Acts 3.19, it tells us, Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away or blotted out. The New Living Translation. Yes, friends, the coming of Jesus is soon to appear and we must be ready for that event. In Matthew 24, 3, the disciples again asked, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Luke 21, 25 says, There shall be signs. And we've already covered some of them. But there's just a few more. In Matthew 24, 7, it says, There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers or different places. We find out that this, the beginning of this year in January, there were massive locust swarms in Middle East and North Africa. Kenya, Africa, has reported that its worst locust outbreak in 70 years. Billions of these insects have already destroyed tens of thousands of hectares of plant life across the country. This will cause famine, one of the signs, as these locusts invade and eat all the green things. Then there's fires. That's another one of the calamities that's happening. Here's a map of Australia and the recent fires they had. Isn't it amazing? This is as of January 28, 2020. 19.4 million hectares have burned in Australia's wildfires. The Christian author who wrote the book Fundamentals of Education wrote, There will soon be a sudden change in God's dealings. The world in its perversity is being visited by casualties by floods, by storms, fires, earthquakes, famines, war, and bloodshed. Page 357. Everything in the world is in agitation. The signs of the times are ominous. The Spirit of God is withdrawing from the earth, and calamity follows calamity by sea and by land. A book by the same author, Maranatha, chapter 27. And yet, the world is consumed with sports and with games. Here's what she says. 
that people are just as ardent today in their games, in their horse racing, and in their love of amusement as were the Antediluvians. Those are the people back in Noah's day who knew not until the flood came and took them all away. They had heaven-sent warnings, but they refused to listen. By their attitude, they declare, We want not thy way, O God. We want our own way, our own will. Written in the Review and Herald, November 27, 1900. 1 John 4.1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. That's another sign of the end, that false prophets would be appearing on the world's scene. Matthew 7.15 says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. I once went to a bookstore where they had a section called Religious Fiction. And there I saw stacks of books, all by the same authors. Tim LaHaye authored 85 books by 2016. He had sold 80 million copies. But it's listed under the Religious Fiction section. Truth, friends, was left behind indeed. In Ezekiel 14, 13 and 19, Son of man, when the land sins against me by trespassing grievously, then I will stretch out my hand upon it and send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood. It says when the land sins against God grievously, that he would send a pestilence. A pestilence, according to Cambridge's dictionary, is a disease that spreads quickly and kills large numbers of people. Well, we've recently experienced a pestilence, haven't we? The coronavirus, many thousands, millions by now, have been infected, and tens of thousands have died all around the world. Dr. Lee tried to sound a warning that a troubling cluster of viral infections in a Chinese province could grow out of control when unfortunately he was then summoned for a middle-of-the-night reprimand over his candor. On Friday, Dr. Lee, age 34, died after contracting the very illness he had told medical school classmates about it on an online chat room, the coronavirus. Well, back about a hundred years ago, there was the flu of the 1918 came upon this world. My great uncle contracted the virus and he died. Meanwhile, my grandfather also contracted the disease. And he was in bed upstairs in the old farmhouse while the funeral was going on for his brother downstairs. And the neighborhood boy was assigned to watch my grandfather during the funeral. Grandfather overcame the flu and lived. Now another question. How will people react when the king returns? In Zephaniah 1.14 it says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. It hastens greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That's one of the things that happens when Jesus returns. And it says, The kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6, 15 and 16. That's the response with many of the people. But Proverbs 14.32 says, The righteous hath hope in his death. The righteous, those that love Jesus and love his appearing. They may be resting in their graves. But 1 Corinthians 15.52 has great news. At the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, it says. What a glorious day. What an absolute glorious day when the righteous rise out of their graves to be resurrected with the loved ones to meet Jesus in the air. So what should we be doing in these last remaining years in preparation for the coming of Jesus? 
we want to bring this to a close. What should we be doing? Well, we should pray as did Daniel. Daniel prayed three times a day. He was alone with God. That's a key thing, to spend time alone with God. Confess every sin you have committed, every mistake you have made or that comes to your mind. God says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Moses spent time alone with God. He was shut in by the bulwarks of the mountains. Remember, he fled from Egypt and he spent 40 years in the wilderness of Arabia. Paul's life was in peril. The Apostle Paul, he went into Arabia there to be alone with God in comparative solitude. He had ample opportunity for communion with God and for contemplation. He wished to be alone with God, to search in his own heart, to deepen his repentance, and to prepare himself by prayer and study. You want to prepare for the coming of Jesus? Find some place where you can be alone with God to search your heart, to deepen your repentance, and to spend time by prayer and study. The solemn messages that we have been given in their order and revelation are to occupy the first place in the minds of God's people. Revelation 14 is a key chapter it's supposed to occupy first place in the minds of God's people. Well, have you ever been robbed? It's not a nice thing to be robbed. Well, it says precious time is rapidly passing and there is danger that many will be robbed of the time which should be given to the proclamation of the messages that God has sent to a fallen world. If we but realize how earnestly Jesus worked to sow the world with gospel seed, we're living at the very close of probation. We would labor untiringly to give the bread of life to perishing souls. That's what we should be doing in these final days. Labor untirely to give the bread of life to perishing souls. At Amazing Facts Ministries, we are dedicated to sharing God's Word all across Canada. The scriptures reveal that we are living in the last days of Earth's history. These are solemn times indeed. We would like to extend to you the opportunity of joining us in this important work through your financial contributions. You will receive a tax-deductible receipt for your donations. It is the support of our viewers which helps make these weekly broadcasts possible. This week we have a special gift we would like to share with you. We want to send it to you free of charge. Give us a call at 877-721-3800 to place your order today and ask for the free offer number displayed on your screen. 877-721-3800. 